Um, because this is uh, one of two public meetings, it's really part one and part two, um, I'm going to start with giving just a brief um, you know, public facing presentation about the history of the CPA and how CPA functions. And then we're going to jump into hearing from our historic applicants. Um, I'll make sure I also go over the scoring criteria before we jump in. At the end of each presentation, which should run about five minutes, maybe six at most, we'll have a few minutes for questions from members of the committee um, and also um, some space if members of the public also want to speak in support of or, you know, voice ask questions about different projects as well. Um, so we're going to dive in. Um, I'm going to start by um, going through this slideshow on CPA, and what it is and how it works. Okay. All right, so CPA across the Commonwealth. So there are 194 CPA communities across our Commonwealth. And 70% of Massachusetts citizens, citizens live in a CPA community. Um, the CPA trust fund is funded by all citizens through their transactions at the Registry of Deeds. So even if a community is not a CPA community, uh, when they go to the Registry of Deeds and have to file their, 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 their work and pay their fees, they are all paying into the CPA trust fund. Um, the state legislature has also voted several times to add additional surplus funding to the, tr to the trust fund. Um, and the state match has varied over the years. I wanted to show this chart because really, you know, the very first few years um, in 2002, when the legislation made this a possibility for communities to opt into this fund, there were so few communities, uh, there were only 34, right, to start with, that they actually could do a 100% uh, match, which is amazing. But that's only because there were only a few communities that really could do um, at the time. Um, as the number expanded and more and more communities joined uh, CPA and levied their own uh, state, um, their own, that levied their own um, uh, surcharge and joined the CPA communities, the amount, of course, spread out amongst all of the communities and it lowered. Um, so I think the lowest match ever was in 2017 when it was 17 percent. Um, but as a result, the, the state legislature has also stepped in a number of times and added millions of dollars in additional surplus funding in order to then also increase the state match. So the last few years, we joined CPA, I believe, in 2015 um, or 2016 in there. And so, you know, over the course of those years, we've had different matches. Last year was this like really high match, um, the highest one that we've experienced so far as the CPA community at 43.84% because they used a lot of their uh, funding um, uh, that they could devote to CPA. They really did devote a lot of it. Um, and then this year was a 38.51% match, which was great. Okay, so Holyoke is a 1.5% surcharge community. Um, some communities have opted into the highest level possible, which is 3%, in order to increase their local tax levy and thus their access to a greater state match. Two and 3% communities are also often invited into additional rounds of funding by the state, which we currently don't have access to. But 1.5% is about average um, of the 194 uh, communities, most are at 1 or 1 1.5%. Okay, automatic exemptions. Holyoke has an automatic exemption on the first $100,000 of property value. Um, without this automatic exemption, the average single family CPA contributions here would have been $66.48. Um, and our local tax levy would have been uh, nearly doubled, which would have increased the budget to over a million dollars. Um, with the increased state match that would have come with it, our CPA budget this year without the exemption would have been $1.6 million. Instead, it's uh, $802 and change. So the fact that we exempt the, the first $100,000 of property value um, sort of knowing where people are at with fixed incomes, with seniors, with folks who um, are, are, you know, owning a property, but maybe struggling to maintain it, that first $100,000 is, is automatically exempted, which really does decrease the amount that we are, um, we're levying. Okay, the average cost of taxpayers. In 2022, the average value of a single home was $219,470. And the average single family home paid $34.51 so CPA fund. Um, this year, with the average single family property value going up to 360, uh, sorry, 236, uh, 262, the average single family home paid $38.34 this year towards a CPA fund. Um, 
our budget, right? So we effectively are looking at that amount that everyone pays in um, and the total raised by our own community as reported by the tax collector is estimated to be a little bit over half a million dollars this year uh, with a state match of 38.51%. That means that we're getting by the state around another $220,000. That means our overall budget this year is gonna be around $800,000. Okay. 10% must be spent in each category each year. So that's affordable housing, um, hit, uh, historic preservation and open space and recreation. And if you don't have any applicants in that category or choose not to fund anything in that category, that 10% has to be uh, saved towards that category in the future. So this year there are no housing applicants. And as a result, 10% um, of our overall funding will be reserved in the housing account for future cycles. Um, and up to 5% can be used to cover administrative costs. Okay, um, really quickly, what have we accomplished over the past five years? So we have a project in every ward in the city. Um, and this map is actually, this is a screenshot from our website, um, which I'll briefly show in just a minute. Um, and it gives you a sense, this is a very interactive map. You can go in and you can uh, zoom in and see where every single project is across the city, uh, what that project was, get some information about how much it cost, a description, sometimes also, you know, photographs or video. Um, this is a list of all of the historic preservation projects that the committee has funded over the past five cycles. Uh, this is a list of the open space and recreation projects. The most expensive projects that, um, or at least like the highest amounts of funding that our committee has supplied so far to any individual project have all come under recreation. Um, so the highest one so far have been the Boys and Girls Club Playground um, and the Miracle League Fully Accessible Playgrounds. And then this is affordable housing. Um, so if you look at the totals by category for historic preservation, that's about 37% of the total. Open space and recreation together are 47% of the total and affordable housing has been 16% of the total funding so far that has been uh, put forward by this committee for a total of $2.7 million over five years. All right, today when we are hearing from our historic applicants, we're gonna be using this scoring criteria. So the committee is going to be, um, you know, using their due diligence to pour through the applications alongside the information that we received from the applicants tonight. And we'll be scoring all applicants on the same criteria, goals alignment, benefit to the city, public support, supporting documentation, project feasibility, the sources of funding, and the restrictions and contractual processes. All right, I'm gonna stop there. Okay, um, we are going to jump in uh, to hearing from our applicants. Each applicant will have about five, six minutes to present and then time for Q&A and then time for anyone from the public who also wants to speak in support of a project or ask a question. Um, I ask if you are here from the public and you want to um, ask a question that you just uh, private message um, Amy Landau, um, the CPA staff, and she will sort of navigate with you when you can speak. Um, and then you can also share your, your questions with her if you're just not sure. Maybe you want her to share it with, um, with me or, or maybe there's another way you want to share information. That's okay too. I know not everybody wants to speak in a public setting. Okay. Um, Amy, do you want to take a minute just to describe uh, the work that you do for the committee and um, any other information that you want to share? Sure, thank you. Um, there's a lot that I do, so I'll just give you a smattering to give you an idea. Um, so I, you know, I'm the uh, CPA coordinator, administrator, and um, a big part of what I do is I just sort of serve as the main channel of communication to the public on um, everything um, related to the Holyoke CPA and the committee activities. Um, I also help, you know, I coordinate the management of the grants in terms of all aspects of the application process. Um, and uh, I review the legislation for eligibility for multiple projects um, to see if the project is eligible, which is the first phase. 
And um, I monitor the progress of the CPA projects and document that over time, you know, looking at deadlines or, you know, uh, communicating with, with the recipients um, on the projects. Um, I also do work on the budget. Um, I review requests for payments from multiple grant recipients. Um, I have to ensure that the, the approved work was completed in accordance with the agreement, um, the contract agreement. And so that involves also, you know, submitting requisition orders and working with the auditor, keeping hard copies of uh, the, dis the disbursements as well. And um, let's see, um, also, you know, I help with, uh, you know, this, this meeting that we're doing right now, all the CPA meetings, letting people know about them and setting up the Zoom, working with um, Holyoke Media, um, help posting the agenda and so forth. Um, I also draft contracts with the uh, different um, uh, the different award recipients. So there's back and forth and negotiation on that as well. Um, and of course, that gets re reviewed by the CPC subcommittee. Um, and I I write up recommendations on the projects for based on you know the CPC's vote. Um, which and those go to city council, and then they have to decide, you know, whether they approve those recommendations. I also report to the Department of Revenue. Um, there are various reports that have to be done on, um, to meet certain deadlines over the year, um, and maintain physical files as well as electronic files on all the different projects. So that gives you an idea. Thank you, Amy. Um, the public survey we're going to share after the second um, round of presentations, right? Is that what you decided? The oh, public um, no. Well, actually, um, I could share that tonight um, because I, I put in the settings that people can um, go back and edit. So if they wanted to put their reaction, you know, to the projects presented tonight, they could then go back and edit when they hear the meet the uh, the meeting for next week, which is going to be the open and rec space project. Okay. Oh, do you want to put that link in the chat then, and then sure. also make sure that we share that on our website and through other forms too. Okay. Okay. Um, well, let's get started. Um, which is the first project um, on the list, Amy? Um, it's the Wisteria Hearst Museum Preservation Planning and Restoration at the at Wisteria Hearst with Megan. All right. Um, I would just remind everyone to meet themselves if they're not the presenter speaking. Um, and um, if you, um, everyone should have the ability who's presenting to share screen. I'm looking at my settings and they look set. Okay. Um, all right. Wisteria Hearst, if you want to take it up. Yes, I'm trying to get it to share the screen and it's not letting me from my computer. I think there's something with my screen settings. I'm so sorry. Oh, darn it. Um, Amy, would you be able to pull up my presentation? I am so sorry. Oh, um, yeah, I think I could do that. It's, it's, For some reason, it's not letting me share it and... Okay. Yeah, luckily you sent it to me beforehand, so. It's always yeah. good to have a plan B just in case. <laughs> yeah. I didn't have a computer home, so it's my home when it's being a little wonky. Okay. Share screen. Okay, here we go. Okay, so thank I just want to say a huge thank you to everyone who works on the CPA committee. It's such a wonderful resource for the city and it has made a huge impact here at Wisteria Hearst. So we greatly appreciate it. Um, our application this year is for preservation planning and damage restoration. Um, and if you could scroll down. So this is a three-part project to address major issues with the masonry work um, and foundation at the Wisteria Hearst Museum. Wisteria Hearst is a nationally recognized historical building with long-standing historical, cultural, and educational asset for the city. We put on um, gallery shows, um, symposiums, uh, exhibitions. We hold the city's archives. We support scholars in the area. We uh, help schools and classrooms with programming as well. 
So we really do love what we provide and we provide a great deal to the community. And if you go on to the next. Um, so the first part of this project will be getting an engineering survey of the property, um, specifically detailing the overall condition of the building with a focus on the masonry work uh, needed. Uh, the engineering survey will help us understand the depth and the breadth of the work needed, and it will also help us apply for matching funds through the preservation mass grants, which require an up-to-date engineering survey of the property. That survey will also in, uh, include a price estimate so we can understand how much money we will need to complete the rest of this work. Um, and as you can see here, this is a couple examples of what's going on at the building uh, and how there's exposed brick from the original um, stucco that's, you know, really hindering the appearance of the building. If you could scroll down. Here are some more examples. We have this really beautiful piazza that faces Pine Street. Um, we used to have some chairs and benches out there for people to enjoy, but um, the stairs have become a, a safety concern. So as you can see, the bricks have shifted. There's um, extensive damage to the bricks where there's chunks missing, the mortars coming apart. So in the summer when it's really beautiful and we'd love people to be able to enjoy it, we actually have to like block that off um, and make sure no one can get hurt. Um, and instead of enjoying it, we have to uh, close it off. If you go on to the next page, here's some more examples of the brickwork that is again on this piazza. Um, you can see there's just giant chunks missing, mortars coming apart. And this is the other staircase um, that featured, that uh, was the original front entrance to the house to the far right. And again, the stairs are shifting. There's mortar missing. Bricks are, chunks of bricks have come out. So it really is in desperate need of some care. Uh, if you go on to the next slide. And then we also have to look at the foundation itself. There is a concern in the basement. This is the part of the basement where the service ramp was put in. We're seeing some bowing and deterioration down there as well. We don't know um, if this needs to be addressed, if this is normal. Again, an engineering survey would go a long way with us understanding the preservation needs of this house. So, um, it's really important to sort of get that in writing to know what our next steps need to be. If you could go on to the next. Um, there's other spots around the house that I just kind of want to highlight. As you can see um, on the left, there's again, separation happening between the bricks and the mortar. We have another issue of you know deterioration in another part of the foundation. Several of the chimneys are showing crystalline salt deposits. So that could mean that we need to, you know, replace those bricks and rebuild that chimney to avoid any future leaks um, because we're seeing missing bricks, damaged bricks, and this um, crystalline salt deposit issue. So if you could scroll down now. Um, so the next step will be um, to repair the chimney that is actually causing the most active and urgent leak. So this is on the second floor that um, faces uh, Cabot Street. The roof and the flashing were inspected because we thought originally that was the issue. Um, but when they went out there to inspect it, they noted severe um, preservation issues with that chimney. So we called uh, Western Mass Masons, who has worked on the property previously and got an estimate from them. And they said that would this would go a long way in helping to stop the leak and would end the leak and help us be able to move forward with the next step of this project. Um, so if you could scroll down, that will be repairing the damage that is currently active in the building. Um, so this room is one of our most, one of my favorite rooms, one of our most beautiful rooms in the house. It's on the second floor um, and it has an amazing historic mural wallpaper on it, which you'll see in, an, in another slide, but it is actively leaking, it's on the ceiling, it's on the wall. And as you can see in the middle one, the wallpaper is starting to come off the wall. And so we really would love to be able to shore up that chimney to stop the leaking and then be able to fix the damage that has been done. If you could scroll down to the next. So the wallpaper, um, I did some digging and we actually found the wallpaper from um, Arthur Sanderson and Sons. It's called the Phoenix Bird, originally created in the 1920s. It came in different color options. 
And it was created with a really amazing um, innovative paper staining technique and was probably designed by um, H. Watkins Wild. And as you can see, this is a publication from the company back in I believe, 1985. It actually features this mural on it. So it may even be possible that we can get a re reproduction to replace the damaged panels. Um, so I've reached out to the company to see if that's something that they could still do. But if not, we can always have a restoration company repaint it to match it as best as possible. So then if you could just scroll down. So this is kind of an old little view of the room. Um, it doesn't give a great view of the mural, but it is actually really much prettier in person. And then on the right, um, the original photo that I featured before was from the um, historic commission meeting. Um, and this is another back in October. And this, as you can see, there's even more crumbling that's happening. So it is a very urgent leak that is causing significant damage that we really do need to remedy. And I thought I would include this photo that I just took a few days ago of how I've cleaned up the dust and it has reappeared and there's even more of it than there was. So if you could scroll down, I believe I have a cost breakdown. I've asked for $95,000. The original cost, the essential first step is getting an engineering survey. That's approximately $64,000. Back in 2018, we had an electrical survey done um, to help prep us for the electrical work that the CPA helped funded uh, back in 2018. And that came in at around $58,000. Adjusting for inflation and making sure that we can cover this because it's a bit more of an extensive look at the overall house we estimate that to come in around 64,000. The chimney estimate came in at 19,000, which an additional $4,450 if we have to go below the roof line to, re to replace the bricks that are there with a total estimated cost coming in at $23,450. And then the interior repair, a similar one was made in 2008 for 3,500 in another room. Uh, with the extensive damage, we think that the remaining 7550 could help cover the wall and ceiling repair. So that is my project. Thank you all so much for having me. Thank you so much. Um, I see um, Michael Falsetti's hands up. Oh, you're muted, Michael. Is that good? Can you hear me? Yep, you're good. Oh, thank you, Madam Chairman. Megan, um, the three components that you just showed, collectively, they all uh, they all add to $95,000, all three collectively. Yes. Uh, it, it, given the rate of inflation and, the, and given the costs of things, are you fairly confident that those three items, given the scope of activity and the money you have, will We'll cover it. I'm a little apprehensive with water damage, as I'm sure we all are, especially with an older building, that upon taking apart the brick or the, or the wall or the wallpaper, uh, you discover things far more extensive than you anticipated. Uh, are you, or, or actually the engineering, the engineering survey, would, would, would they answer that question um, specifically? Um, so the engineering survey, like, um, that may help address some of those and give cost estimates for the overall project. We went to the chimney. I got the chimney estimate um, back in, I think the summer. And so it's a pretty recent estimate, which would include them going below the roof line to then replace the bricks and shore up the leaking. So that came in a little over $24,000 on the high end. And then when we looked at the similar work, it was actually a larger water damage that was done in 2008. It came in, around, it came in at $3,500. Um, I'm working on another project from the, around the same time, and everything has basically doubled since 2008. So we have doubled the estimate with a little bit of a buffer in there as well, so that hopefully we can do all of those things, um, it's possible that the water damage could maybe be a little bit higher. Um, but again, that's, I think the leaking and the engineering survey are number one top priority. And then I think we can at least do some cosmetic work 
on that bed on that bedroom and um megan the cosmetic work you're referring to that would be done by a preservation company that does that kind of work absolutely yes both the plaster repair and the wallpaper repair and the painting absolutely and all of that has to be approved with our point person um with mass preservation and we would you know go through the process and make sure that they're on the list of approved people who can do that work we want to make sure it's done right so we don't have to do it again <laughs> when, when did one last question when did you if, if on the presumption that you get approved this evening and and by the city council were you willing to do you have a start date in your mind um you know a ballpark start date for the engineering survey um we can put that out um to bid as soon as the money is secured, I can work with Chris Baker, the city engineer, to help me get that out. And of course, that takes a little bit of time to advertise and then you get the the proposals in and then you can review them and, you know, you sign in the contract. So it would be a few months out from when we receive the approval. But once that's done, hopefully we can get it, the ball rolling on that and get that underway. But I have the Mason work um, he's someone that we've worked with, that company's people that we've worked with before. So as soon as we can move ahead, we can also start that project. We know that that absolutely has to be done. So we don't have to wait to do the chimney. We already know that that's, that work needs to happen. Yeah, good idea. Um, I'm remembering last year when you came to us uh, around this project, Initially, this was sort of all in one project. So last year when you presented, it was, we're doing this holistic exterior restoration of the building. There's a lot of work that needs to be done that involves whether it's, you know, fixing, repainting and boards that are now like bare and exterior masonry work. And like, I, I remember all that being the same project that because there was other grant funding that didn't occur? Yeah, our hope had been to get matching funds um, last year from Preservation Mass. And because we didn't have an updated engineering survey of the building that encompassed this work, we didn't, we weren't able to qualify for it. And again, this was something, it was my first year here. I had no idea that that was I figured we had a pretty recent engineering survey that would probably be fine, but that was really focused on the electrical work. So it didn't give the preservation mass a, a good overview of, of what needed to be done. So that's why we're starting with making sure we know what needs to be done and we can hopefully when the work comes up to do all of this preservation work on the masonry work and the foundation is that we can hopefully apply for matching grants and that way we can because I, I estimate it'll, it'll be a very expensive project. So if we can, whatever we can do to help offset the cost for the city and CPA, and if we can use CPA to match that and bring in more revenue, more money for the city, to get this project done, that would be great. So unfortunately, the last project would, didn't qualify for that. And so that's why we're kind of trying it in this next phase and trying to go about and get it done okay. <laughs> in steps. Because effectively phase three, after the engineering study is shown, it might be like, you need to now repair 10 chimneys. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's okay. scary. <laughs> well, and that's another reason why when I had the, the chimney guy out there and he took a drone and he said, oh, you're, you're going to need, you know, more than this. He's like, but this is the one that's leaking the worst, but there's a lot of chimneys that are missing bricks and you should really think about doing an overall engineering survey. And I said, well, yeah, we're kind of thinking that, but we'll make sure we include the chimneys in that <laughs> because yeah, there, there could be other things that we just can't even see right now. There could be leaks that I don't even know about. And we do a monthly inspection of the building, but there could be things happening in the empty space between the roof line and the third floor. Cause even though it's a mansard roof, which the third floor is the roof line, there's still empty space up there that could be you know, there could be things that are starting to happen that we don't even know about. So an engineering survey is going to go a long way in helping prepare us for the next phase. Okay, thanks. Um, any other questions from the committee? Uh, 
Hi, um, can I ask a question? Yes. Hi, I'm Nathan from the planning board. I just joined. Um, you know, I, I read about, you know, your engineering survey description mentioned the uh, like foundation and you show the foundation in the presentation as well, but that's not listed as one of the things to do. Um, you know, I guess, what is the reason for that? And if there's a curveball that happens that says your foundation is in is the most serious issue because there might be some structural issues, um, would you have a, a plan B? Um, so the most of the foundation is made up of, of masonry bricks. And so that's why we kind of included that in the when we put it out to bid, we'll make it incredibly clear that it is including the foundation. When we had the survey done in 2018, they did an overall condition report. Um, and we're hopeful that there's no serious issues because they didn't report any then. The only thing they said was to have a more detailed look at that section of the foundation that I just showed you, the blue with the, um, it's where our service entrance is. They thought that could need work. But the overall foundation, they said, was in pretty good shape. So we're hopeful that that's still the case. <laughs> if not, then we have to sort of think about next strategies. But at least we'll have a plan of how we can move forward. And we will know the full scope of work that needs to be done. And I think that's a really good first step for the next phase of the project. When we uh, did the work on Lady Liberty being restored, the study itself was very detailed, similar with like the, the stained glass restoration project. The studies that you pay for as expensive as they are because they come back with effectively an instruction manual for all of the work and how it will be done. Is that what we're talking about here? Like that engineering study, will it come back with, here's all the work that needs to get done and here's how you would do it? So that's, yeah. So the, when we had the electrical survey done, they did an overall condition report of the house, but then they provided step by step the things that need that were deteriorated that needed to be redone. And so that will be what we're asking for with this engineering survey is to say, OK, this is what we need you to pay attention to. Give us an overall condition report, but we need details on all of the work, especially foundation masonry work that has to be done on the. It, and that way it kind of helps write the scope of work when we put it out to bid. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Um, sorry, one more. Yeah, that, that's the part I wasn't clear about during the presentation and reading the application. Like, is, is the, the engineering survey portion of what you're proposing in the application um, is, the, is everything that will come out of it covered by uh, the the different actual projects, the hard costs you're suggesting, I, it sounds like it wouldn't. So no. I, I, I guess I'm bringing this up because engineering survey is very expensive. You know, typically like in a lot of government um, government uh, architecture project, I understand 11% is usually the cost of design or other in you know, a more engineering type of, um, uh, type of aspect of the project. So in this case, that sort of equation is flipped. And so my, I guess my concern is that it would be really nice if they are giving a very thorough study, um, if they're giving a very thorough engineering study about everything else that needs to be done, that, you know, we stay rehearsed and the city would be able to act upon all those recommendations and implement all those solutions. It's just, if you end up doing a very small portion of what came out of the engineering survey, um, in a way, it's, 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 a, it's sort of a... Okay, waste of money is too strong a word, so I apologize, but it's like sort of some of that engineering um, study that we, you know, the project spend money on goes away. So that's sort of my, that's, I guess, my concern. Well, it, it absolutely has to be done. Anything that's identified in the survey that's work that needs to be done is what our goal is. So another aspect of the survey is cost estimates that help us apply for other grants and help us know how much money we do need to secure to move forward on the rest of the work. So for this section, we really wanted to be able to get the survey, but also get the chimney repaired that's currently leaking and then like do the preservation work on the room. 
But the overall goal is that this is part of a much larger preservation project for the rest of the house. So that way, when we come back, hopefully next year and say, all of this needs to be done. The engineering firm estimated these costs at X, Y, and Z. So we're asking the CPA for half of that. And then we're applying for a preservation mass grant for the other half. So that way we have CPA money is matching. And then we can move forward to fully complete the work that needs to be done. So this is just a smaller phase of a much broader project. And at the end of the day, we can't neglect doing anything here if we want to preserve this asset for the city. Right, right. <clears throat> Great. Thank you. Yeah, I'm done with questions. Thank you very much. All right. Great questions. Thank you, everyone. Um, just I'm going to pause now in case there's anyone from the public. Um, Amy, has anyone reached out to you? Um, I can uh, just remind everyone that if they do have a question, just to type something into the into the chat to me um, and or let me know and um then maybe do you, meg would you want them to t just me to convey the question to you through the chat or for you to I'm, call on i'm them? happy to have folks speak and if they want to or send it to you in the chat to be shared that way whatever they prefer okay so if anybody has a question at any time just you know um send me a message through the chat and let me know you have a question then i can let meg know that right now i don't see anything so well, if there's anyone that wants to speak in support or ask a question, just let us know um, and we'll start moving uh, to the next presentation. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, um, Amy, which project is next? Yes, yeah, so next up is the Rights Block um, project, um, 106, to, 106 to 120 High Street Rehabilitation. All right, um, Vadim Tolchinsky, you're presenting. Yes, I am. Hi, everybody. Hi. How are you? Okay. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen here. I don't know if uh, everybody can, can see that. Yep. Okay. Okay, great. <clears throat> Excuse me. Sorry if I'm a little scratchy today. Well, thank you everybody so, so much for uh, allowing us to present and to apply. Uh, we're very excited to work with the city on this project. So this is, uh, I myself am Vadim Tolchinsky. Uh, my partners are here with me, Alec Busey and Bill Wommeldorf. Uh, together we are Urbanist Development and we're working on a project that's very near and dear to our hearts. Uh, which is the buildings at 106 through 120 High Street, uh, collectively known as the Rights Block, um, sometimes known as the former Warnick Furniture Building. So <clears throat> to give a little bit of historical context, uh, this building or a series of buildings is located in the nationally recognized North High Street Historical District, this was one of the very first blocks built uh, within the Holyoke downtown core, uh, built in the 1870s, 80s, and 90s in the Italianate style, very popular at the time, and truly an integral part of the city both then and now, uh, both from a cultural and uh, economic uh, angle. Um, part of the, the fabric of the city. So right now, oh, and um, this is one of the very last uh, contiguous blocks surviving from that era. Um, fortunately, we've all seen the, the kind of demolition that has taken place over the, the course of the years. So this is, this is one of the last few of, it, of, of its kind. Um, so this is what it looks like from aerial view. Uh, it's uh, due to urban renewal, it's on the very end of High Street. It, it didn't used to be that way. And it's no secret that High Street and the areas around it are challenged to, to say the least. Um, 
there's there's vacancy, an unfortunate amount of vacancy, particularly on the floors above the first floor. Um, they're almost it, vacancy is more the norm than than not. Um, a lot of vacancy on the on the re, on the retail floors as well, and um, you know, and it's a, it's a source of blight, uh, unfortunately, um, across the city. Uh, you know, this is a very important corridor for the city. It's about a block, block and a half away from City Hall. Um, it's part of the city's effort to establish these contiguous um, corridors, these dense retail and, and residential corridors through the city, among them High Street, Dwight Street, Race Street, Main Street, and, and, and so on. And so we're, we're trying to do our part to restore it, and that's that's what this project is about today. So we we know what the unfortunate alternatives are. This is the building right across the street from ours. We actually watched as it got torn down. This is 111 through 115 High Street. We the three of us stood with near tears in our eyes on the second floor of our building, watching this happen right across the street from ours. And it's just a stark reminder of why it's so important to preserve these architectural landmarks and uh, both for uh, not just for the historic aspect and to, to pass it on to, to future generations, but also for economic reasons, social safety reasons, all, all that kind of stuff. So Sorry, that, that when was that? When so was that? That, that happened in, uh, uh, Bill, if, if you could chime in, that was, I believe, two years 2020. ago? 2020. Okay, thank you. Yeah. So what we're, what we're uh, asking for here is uh, just, so what this project entails is uh, we're, we're looking for funding for three separate things. The first is <clears throat> we went out and got exact quotes for what the windows would need to be restored to for both regular vinyl code compliant windows and historical replicas of the original windows. And the difference between the two is about $3,000. So it's about $1,000 for just the regular vinyl and then $4,000 for these beautiful historical replicas. So going all the way around the building, that difference between the two costs is this figure that you see here, this $267,000, uh, sort of over and above what, what the project would need uh, just to be code compliant. Um, next, we are asking, uh, well, we need $130,000 for various historical details around uh, the building, including the beautiful and historic incinerator in the back uh, that they would use for burning trash and refuse before they cared about things like, oh, health and the safety of the citizens, uh, fun, fun memories there. And uh, the third thing that we're trying to get done here is we're going to build a ramp uh, as part of a deck on the right side of the building. Uh, this is going to provide ADA access to the storefront on the right. We already have provided ADA access for the other three storefronts. Um, but this will round out that portion of the project. So what's important to note here is that all of these costs put together are the figure you see on the bottom left, the $426,000. All we're asking is, is for 250,000 of that. So the reason we're doing that is we want to be sensitive to the fact that there are other projects this year. There's only so much funding and we want to show good faith and not ask for the moon and then, you know, be talked down. This is what we think we can reasonably ask for and, um, and uh, you know, push forward on the project with. So we know, as Megan noted before, that um, this project is going to be assessed in terms of the various uh, items on the scoring rubric. Um, so we thought we'd just make a couple points to, uh, to, to see if we could be helpful on that score. Um, so first and foremost, the, the project is very highly visible. It's right, uh, it's a block away from 
City Hall. It's right in a major intersection, a major thoroughfare uh, for both foot traffic and uh, car traffic. Um, it's a it's a key section of the downtown. Um, the project is consistent with the city's priorities for rehabilitation, and uh, it facilitates growth, uh, not just in the tax base directly, but also indirectly as it uh, reduces blight and uh, spurs development around it as well. And it also increases accessibility uh, in an ADA sense in a historic building, which is also always notable. So the benefits to the city should be pretty evident. Um, it, it helps rebuild the downtown, increases the tax base, removes blight, helps add foot traffic, uh, both in the retail sense and in the residential sense. So we're talking about, you know, both in day and night. And it helps preserve the historical legacy of the city moving forward for future generations. Um, on the public support rubric, uh, we were very fortunate to so far have got letters of recommendation in various forms from the mayor, the Economic Development Office, uh, the Historic Preservation Trust, and the Historic his, uh, the Holyoke Historic Commission. Um, we also have support from Richard Neal's office and various neighbors, including Paper City Clothing and the Unicorn Inn. So we're, we're very, very grateful to all our local support. Um, one important thing to note is we have uh, all the supporting documents. Uh, we, we have exact uh, estimates for, for everything uh, that I've mentioned here. And on the project feasibility front, this project is absolutely shovel ready. Um, that, that doesn't mean we're gonna install the windows with shovels, it's, uh, but we, it does mean that we have the zoning approvals, um, the environmental due diligence, the advanced plans, the structural reports, all of that is, is ready to go. Uh, one important note on the sources of funding is that uh, we we have other sources of funding. This is this is not uh, you know we we've been very careful to to spread the load. So we have East Hampton Savings Bank standing by. Um, we have their approval. We have Mass Development offering their support. Um, we have uh, um, uh, historical tax credits at the state and the federal level. We we've got other sources of funding that that, that we're currently working on, but this does two very, very important things. First of all, it helps to bridge a really crucial funding gap between what is simply a you know, code compliant project and what could be a beautiful historical restoration project. And it also tremendously helps us to gain support from the state and federal funding for additional funds because those will frequently ask for local partners and local funding as a way of showing concrete support from the city and, and, and local players. So this amount of money is not just in its own right important, but really important to garner additional funding down the road from both state and federal funds. So this is what the project looks like now. And this is what we hope to be able to turn it into with your support, both moral and financial uh, we thank you so, so very much for working through with us on this application and being so, so very helpful as we sort of stumbled our way through it. And um, so we, uh, we'd love to open the floor up to your questions. All right, I see uh, Michael Falsetti's hand. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Chairman. Um, Vadim, is that how you pronounce your first name? Yeah, Vadim. Vadim, yes, Vadim, sir. You, um, I have to tip my hat to you. You certainly did your homework, and um, the exhaustive uh, presentation that you sent us was as complete and as thorough an application as I've seen. You really have done your you've done your due diligence in terms of the preparation and the the rationale and the funding. And uh, I, I thank you. Uh, um, this touches all the bases for approval. Uh, whether it gets approved or not is another matter, but as far as I'm concerned, you, you meet all the qualifications, certainly. Um, what gives me pause is um, I'm looking at the, uh, uh, what's described as a section two, the project budget. You alluded to that uh, very a little bit while ago. It's table 
5.2 project funding sources. And you do, as you indicated, uh, uh, list the funding sources, East Hampton Bank Loan committed in 2022, Massachusetts uh, tax credits are pending, National Park Service is pending, Mass Development Pace and Journey uh, Energy Program is pending, um, and you've got uh, $466,000 committed by private individuals uh, and so on. Uh, uh, how pending, how strong is the pending? What causes me concern is what if you have three pending uh, 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 applications close to, uh, 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 well, quite a bit of money, over a million dollars? Is it in, do you have to get all these three pending to make this job work? Uh, or if you were to lose one of these or get awarded one of these three pending approvals, uh, how would that uh, affect your uh, uh, affect your project? It, first of all, thank you so so much for the for the compliments. I, I have to give credit where credit is due. Um, my my partners have been absolutely spectacular. Um, Alec and 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 Bill um, have absolutely bent over backwards to to uh try to get this project off the ground uh bill has has absolutely uh bled for this project in in trying to put all this stuff together so um i absolutely uh, uh couldn't have done it without them and uh, shout out to them um your your question is a is a really astute one uh so i i have two questions uh, two answers to that the, the first is we tried to ask the CPA for funding only for those projects which are externally visible. So um, at the absolute worst, even if the, uh, the construction behind the windows doesn't move forward, the goals will still have been completed, which is that the exterior of the project will have been restored. And that in itself is a big boon to the, to the community. It reduces blight, it shows, visitors, locals, that the city cares, uh, that this is a place that people want to be. So that's going to happen no matter what, uh, provided the CPA funding gets approved. As far as your question about the approvals on the other uh, applications, we feel very strongly about them. Um, they're, they're largely, uh, as of right, provided we, we hit uh, all, of the, um, all of the requirements. We're working with uh, two consultants right now, one out of Boston and one locally. Um, we're, we're, we feel really, really strong about those applications. Um, and we're working with the National Health, I'm sorry, the National State Park Service um, to just basically firm up exactly what it is that, that they want from us. It's more a question of what rather than whether. Um, and it, should any of those not work out, uh, then we have plenty of other avenues to pursue subsidies um, up to and including uh, lower income housing at the 80% AMI level. Um, we've been asked by the city not to pursue those just yet um, because the, uh, the city is looking to integrate market rate housing and, and into that portion of the downtown to, to create more of a mixed income neighborhood. Um, so, we we feel pretty good on just the historic portion of it, but there's plenty of sources on, on the back end to, to pursue it if those don't move forward, which we feel pretty good that they will. Yeah, um, Vadim, um, what is the timeline for the Massachusetts Historical Commission, National Park Service and Mass Development PACE? Is that whole process a year between application and approval on all three of those? In other words, of those three, uh, uh, those three proposals right there for funding, does it normally take a year from application to award for a timeline? I can take that one on, Vadim, if you don't mind. Um, so this is Bill Walmulder here. Uh, to answer your question, Michael, uh, we actually get incremental funding uh, through each quarterly cycle with uh, Massachusetts Historical Commission. Uh, we expect to basically apply for uh, about 100 grand each cycle, including through construction. So we can actually 
uh, get those historical tax credits, you know, during construction as well. So uh, you, a three year time frame for the tax credits isn't a big uh, leap of faith for us. It's because the tax credits really come at the end of the project anyways. Uh, what we're looking at is that uh, adding those as equity into the project where we can now get a syndicator to come in and you know, provide the construction funding for that equity on the back end later on. Okay. Uh, so we do have a syndicator who's ready to go there. Uh, they have faith in us that we will get those credits because as Vadim mentioned, they're as of right. Uh, so that syndication will allow us to, to move forward with construction even before securing all those tax credits. And, and I did want to add to that with the East Hampton bank loan, we do have that $2 million that is available that, you know, worst came to worst, we could always do a, a phase one of this project where we just do the, the exterior restoration. I see. Um, okay, uh, this is for uh, another a couple of questions, uh, fellas, whoever wants to answer it, uh, um, you can decide. Um, again, you did a, such a thorough job. Uh, I really have to compliment you. It's, it's as complete as complete can be. Right now, I'm referring to the uh, Bennett Franklin Real Estate Services, which is in the CPA application supporting attachment, pages 10 through 12. Uh, and this letter is dated March 16th, 2020 from Michael Alexic uh, regarding the um, uh, appraisal report. I don't know if you fellows have that in front of you or not. It, it, it's your CPA application supporting attachment that was the chapter, and it's I'm referring to page 10 through page 12. So, Michael, just for clarification for others, I, I brought this up for my computer to just have. It is Appendix G um, as part of the application for um, rights block. So I have it up. Um, so thank you for giving the page number, but it is Appendix G, which is, says other funding for those who may have the documents. Um, well, uh, that being said, um, a couple of things give me concern. And, and I realize this has nothing to do with the approval because you, you meet all the qualifications for approval. There's no question about it. Um, what bothers me though is the money. Um, as a basis for this report, uh, Bennett uh, Franklin appraisal report, um, the third paragraph, oh, actually the second paragraph and the third paragraph refer to the actual uh, conditions of the property and the funding and, and the amount of money generated on a monthly basis for rent. You have uh, loft style studios and one, two and three bedroom units, about $114,000 per unit. Um, my first question is what portion of your monthly operating expenses do these 19 market rate apartments um, uh, um, contribute? It, they, every month you have to meet a requirement to pay the bank, to pay the mm. whoever your loan officers are and so on and so forth, your financial obligations. What port, to your knowledge, what portion do this, the 19 market rate apartment units uh, uh, pay, uh, make up uh, of the total cost on a monthly basis that you have to, uh, you have to generate. And also, um, if you don't, if you don't rent them, uh, what happens then? Uh, that's my first concern. My second concern is the lack of parking. Um, it, it says here you have uh, uh, parking for more or less six cars uh, about, and uh, given that neighborhood, and given the fact that there's no uh, off-street parking, it's public parking in that neighborhood, you're asking a lot for people to rent an apartment and you have to, at this point in time, admit it's not exactly ideal since there was an incident in the bar two doors, a couple of doors down in the last week or two. It's not exactly an ideal neighborhood. And the fact that, and, and again, I'm not, I'm not criticizing, believe me, I, I, I hope you guys succeed wildly. Uh, um, I'm not criticizing, but I'm just concerned that because you don't have off-street off parking, you don't have lighted protective parking, um, you, um, the, the chances of you getting people down there to rent all 19 market rate apartments is going to be quite difficult. Uh, and um, 
Uh, that's also brought up uh, in the front, in the page uh, under uh, under the Ben Franklin Real Estate Services. When you turn the page, it says no, and it talks about stabilized units um, and the need to rent uh, as soon as possible prior to the end of construction, have it all rented up, and the dangers that would happen if you don't. And um, so that that those two uh, that real estate service appraisal. The fact uh, it caused me concern. Uh, you have 19 apartments um, that I wonder how much that you, the day the thing is done, they should be all rented up to make the bankers happy, to make all your lenders happy. You don't have, on, you don't have a, a parking lot, a, a lighted uh, private parking lot, if you will, just for them, it's public parking in that neighborhood. That's kind of a stretch. And I'm not being critical. It's not your. It's it, it's not your. Um, uh, it's not your fault. But that's the way it is. And I'm wondering that if you don't have these <coughs> apartments rented up the day you uh, open up for business, and they're not already rented, as this Bennett Franklin Real Estate Service appraisal indicates, you're going to have a problem. So I'm worried about you not being able to attract market rate rents. Number one. You don't have uh, off-street parking, number two, and how much of those rents, both the, uh, the apartments and the downstairs commercial units, to collectively together contribute to the bottom line on a monthly basis that you need to operate. Uh, can you just comment, either one of you can comment on that? Yeah, absolutely, I, I, I can speak to this. Um, you know, it, it's certainly no secret that this is a, a challenged area. Um, that's why we're doing what we're doing, and we're we're hoping to make a difference in in that in whatever small way we can. Um, so that let me speak to the parking first. So we actually already got a, a variance. Um, so we have all the zoning variance permits required, so that uh, we we don't need to provide any parking at all. In fact, we won't. Um, that appraisal was done at the time that there, there were six parking spots, um, which were grandfathered in. They're not up to code. Uh, so that's going to be replaced with that deck that you, that you see there in the rendering. Um, as far as the desirability of it, I have absolutely no doubt uh, that, that we're going to get these filled. Um, we own about 50 units within the town, and we're incredibly bullish on Holyoke. Um, we, we love the town. Uh, we have tremendous demand from tenants uh, when whenever we list anything for rent. Um, and much of this comes from people that understand all the challenges that these buildings uh, offer. You know, we have a building that is just down the street um, uh, in the 300 block of High Street. Likewise, not a single parking space provided and we've never had a, any problems at all renting it out. You know, people understand, uh, so there's two options for people. One is they simply don't have a car. They work in town, they um, they walk to work or they bicycle to work and, and that's how they choose to live. The other is that they have a car and they just accept that it's gonna be parked, you know, a block or two away and, and they walk to it. There's plenty of public uh, parking around. And also, um, the city has offered us many times uh, uh, permit parking within the various garages, which are, uh, we timed it. It was about a three, three and a half minute walk to the nearest garage on Dwight Street. So um, we're, we're really not worried. Um, but one other thing that I'll say on this topic is even though um, we have complete confidence in renting it out, you know, immediately, um, uh, what we're going to do simply because we think it's the right thing to do is we're going to partner with local organizations as well, uh, such as CHD um, and others uh, to provide about 50% of the spaces to them on a right, right of first refusal basis. Um, we've had great experiences with them before. We work with them in other buildings and um, uh, we, we want to get local uh, partners um, involved in the project. So 
even out of the gate, we think that about half of the project is going to be pre-leased to these organizations on a kind of a master lease basis. And then the rest, I, I have absolutely no uh, qualms about getting filled, you know, within, you know, the CHD even, even prior to the end of construction. Excuse me, is CHD the Center for uh, Human Development or is that something else? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, exactly. A local office on, on Appleton Street and we've had great success working with them and, you know, we, we love their, their clientele, you know, we, 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 we want to help, um, you know, whatever local agencies that, that we can, you know, they, they struggle for, for, to find landlord partners. So we're, we're happy to step up in whatever small ways we can. Vidim, can you quickly just clarify who CHD is? Oh, yes, of course. Um, CHD is, uh, uh, as someone said, uh, Center for, uh, Human Development. This is a, a nonprofit organization that deals with um, tenants that have uh, various mental health issues, and so they provide various services to them, uh, up to and including housing, um, whether on a on a basis where they simply guarantee the rent, or sometimes they will actually pay the rent on their behalf, um, sort of depending on what their clients' needs. Thank you. Um, I also see Israel Rivera's hand is up. I want to um, give him space to speak. Uh, thank you, guys. I'm sorry I'm late. I just came home from a, another graduation that I have to host from my job. Um, I guess uh, for me, coming in on this, I didn't, I didn't hear all the details on the project. I just heard um, some of the some of the details. So, is this all going to be marketplace um, market rent? Um, on with regards to the building or will there be some way to kind of mitigate some of the or I guess for me the concern I have with all the new stuff that's happening on high street and downtown is that there's going to be gentrification and there's going to be people being being pushed out so for me I, I ask everyone the same question I've asked people in the TDI district stuff what are the things that are we putting in place for mitigation on gentrification not just people that live in the apartments but also the businesses that are working in the storefronts because once all this starts booming on high street, their rents will go up and some of them will not be able to maintain the business that they've been having for several years, 10, 15 years with this new influx of stuff. So for me, it's like, what, what do we have in mind for that, um, for future services and stuff like that? Like, just want to put that on the way. Of course. No, it's a, it's a, it's a great question. And it's a very important topic that's near and dear to our hearts. So I, I've got a couple answers for, for that question. The first is that um, the market rate rents for this building and uh, frankly for the entire downtown area are substantially below uh, what they call area median income. Uh, so if we were to go and get low income uh, subsidies, um, at the 80% AMI, meaning people would have to qualify for, um, I, I'm sure you know, but just for those that don't, um, it means uh, it would be restricted to those making 80% of the area's median income. So, um, you know, low, low income. Our rents are still lower than that. So it's, we're, we're quite a ways away from any sort of displacement. I, I think it's not gonna happen for many, many years. And so the, the types of things that we're, we're talking about are creating apartments and creating s storefronts where there were none, as opposed to displacing people that were there already. Um, and I would just say that at, at this point where, where Holyoke is down, uh, you know, downtown in particular, um, there's, there's, a, there's, I don't want to say no displacement because I, I I'm sure there's, things that that I don't know about certainly yeah that's um, what people said about race street yeah because there was all empty so there's no displacement um but I think that for me it, it's it's not that how do you say it's not that that moment of displacement it's what happens five to seven years later down the road after the fact so now at race street if you look at race street now the way it is but when you go into the flats neighborhood those rents in that neighborhood have gone up exponentially over the last five to six years. And some of that is because of some of the cubit living and some of the stuff that's happening 
that close to the proximity. So I, this is going to happen regardless. I just want us to think about it in the future and, and to keep it on our minds so that way we're noticing and paying attention to what's happening when we make our decisions. Sure. I, I would just, with, with all due respect, um, I, I would just push back a, a little bit if you allow me. It, sure. I, I, I completely understand what you're saying. And in fact, I support it uh, completely. Um, however, what I would say is, in my, in my opinion, the r increase in rents across the city have come from not because of the construction of new housing, but because of the lack of construction of new housing, which is to say, there's lots of people that want to live in our city. Um, there's a lot of people that want to come here for any number of reasons. It's a wonderful place to live. I, I think a lot of outsiders, you know, don't, don't appreciate that, but it's a great place to be. And so there's a lot of demand of people wanting to come in. And if we take a look at the amount of new housing that has been created over the last 10 years, it's basically zero. I mean, it's the qubit, it's a couple projects that we can all list on basically one hand. So as the demand grows with absolutely no new supply, rents have to go up. And that's what we've seen in the city is that rents have skyrocketed. And so in our small way, by providing additional housing, we're taking a small, small, small chunk out of that rise. Rents are still gonna rise, but it's it's much more a question of we're not creating enough housing. We need to be building hundreds and hundreds of new units to accommodate all the people that wanna be here. Awesome. And, and, and to, to, to your point, so uh, just one more point, because I, I don't want you to think that this is not an important issue. For no, us no, no, I'm here, I'm so hearing you. I'm when, when we did this project, yeah, yeah. So. We, we actually wanted to initially consider this project as a low-income housing. And we talked about this with the city and we decided not to do it. Uh, not because we don't think it's important. We think it's crucially important. But when you take a look at, and you draw a, a two block radius around the building, you'll see that it's almost exclusively affordable housing, right? So what the city said to us was, can you please not go the affordable housing route specifically here because we want some, we want a mixed income group of, of people, some low income, some non-low income, because that's going to help the, the retail as well. You see what I mean? So if it was the case that everything around it was market rate, we would have gone the other way and gone low income. You know what I mean? Diversify the income mix. So I, I, I hope that that answers your question. No, that that, that, that works. No, thank you. Yeah. I appreciate that. I just have to, I ask that question to everybody that's in the district on High Street that are, that are doing um, work in South Holyoke, the flats and those neighborhoods, just because I, I, I'm originally from Gary, Indiana. All of my family's in Chicago. I, I, I remember going to Humble Park in Chicago when I was a little kid and then going to Humble Park in Chicago now, and it's a huge difference. And I feel like there's little things that are showing me some different signs that are happening out here that could similarly, similarly, I mean, that happened out there that could similarly happen here. Yeah, but I, I know, I know we have to move on, but um, I, I really thank you for your concern. And uh, yeah. if you have some time, we, we'd love to show you the, the project up close. No, of course. You thank you. Time. Um, let's hear next from um, Nathan. And then um, I think there may be another question that I, I missed at one point with a hand raised. Let's go to Nathan next. Hey, uh, I'm impressed. I didn't catch this earlier. Uh, I'm a micro loan investor in one of the businesses renting this space. So following conflict of interest laws, I don't think I can deliberate on this. So um, I'm just going to shut off my video listening, but uh, I'm not going to try to do anything to influence the deliberation. And I hope that doesn't hurt our quorum. I hope, I think we have enough quorum still. So my apologies for that, but I'm just telling you that. And I'm, I'm here I'm just shutting off my video. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions before we move to our final, third and final project? Yes, Michael. Um, yeah, thank you, Madam Chairman. Um, Bill and Vadim, um, again, you've done an exemplary job in your reports and your engineering surveys, and your project looks terrific. And I hope it's as successful as successful can be. I, I just have to say, I'm, I'm a little concerned about your lack of parking um, at night to have someone who want to rent an apartment there and walk 
even if it's three to four minutes at night, maybe a tough pill to swallow if you want to live there. I know you fellows know your business, but I, I'm just a little apprehensive about it. We're committing a quarter of a million dollars of the taxpayers' money uh, on, a, on a great project that's certainly worth it. But because of the location and lack of parking, and um, I sure hope you're right about your rental analysis because uh, you have more faith than I do, but you know your business more than I do. So I wish you the best of luck. Uh, you certainly have done your, your, your job. And um, uh, I just hope you get things rented prior to the final show, then the final uh, opening night. Um, and you will all sleep better, actually. But good luck, fellas. It, Michael, you. one thing I didn't answer on the prior one is we are going to finish these buildings in phases so there's four towers so they're, they're going to all come online at different points in time throughout the year which will reduce our absorption into the market so it'll only be about like five or so apartments at a time that'll be coming online um good. i think in, in concept with the pre-leasing i think we're going to do a, a, an excellent job but the bus station is uh it's hard to see from there but it, it's across diagonal from the property it, Probably no more than a two minute walk. Yeah, no, that's a very good idea, Bill. Good way to, that's a good idea. Phase it one, two, and three. Yeah, good idea. I'll yeah, set these have to liked it, especially just from the uh, the performance of you know having nineteen apartments go listed in line at a time will, like you said, I, I think be a challenge. But having four or five at a time, I think, is going to be a manageable process. All right, good idea. Uh, all set, Madam Chairman. I'm I'm all set. All right, anyone else have a final question before we move to our third and final project? Okay, all right, thank you so much um, for your presentation. And we're gonna move next to hear about the um, documents project um, from City Hall. Olivia, are you presenting? Hi, yes, here I am. I'm going to bring up my screen. Oh, I'm so sorry, Olivia. Just pause one second. Is there anyone um, who uh, from the public who has a question about the previous project or wants to speak in support? Okay, just don't want to move on without creating that space. All right, thank you. Okay, go ahead, Olivia. Okay, hello everyone. I'm going to try and share my screen with me with you. PowerPoint. If I can do that, not sure it's working. We don't see anything yet. Did you have the green arrow down at the bottom of the screen? I did. And it comes up with a screen that says, oh, basic desktop, share. Uh, yes, you wanna click the screen that has the presentation on it and click share. system there can you see that not yet hmm <laughs> any do you have her presentation i don't L olivia i i did send you a chat before if you want to email me if the link i could you know share screen for you okay i'm sorry i thought i had it uh, set up like that but um Guess not, huh? No worries. Okay. I don't think you sent it to me beforehand. Did I, you? No I, no, I didn't. Okay. No, no. okay. Um,
It's on its way, I think, uh, Amy. Okay, I'm keeping an eye out for it. Okay. Well, I was going to take you, thank you, thank you all for being patient. Um, um, this is a document recovery. I'm going to take you, I'm going to show you some pictures of the basement, City Hall basement. And um, this project was undertaken in uh, before the pandemic in 2019 at, at the um, suggestion of our city historian, Penny Martorell. She provided us with some professional, a professional property restoration um, uh, business in Marlboro, Mass. And so the gentleman came out pro bono uh, we went down to the basement and uh, we looked at some of the um, journals and uh, I'll show you uh, shortly. I, I tried to put more journals or more pictures in the packet, but um, uh, there's 30 or more journals housed in the basement. Oh, can, very nice. Are you seeing that now? Can you see that? Yes, we can. Yes. Okay. Okay. So I'll go to um, the next next slide. Oops. Is this the first slide? Yes, yeah, the first slide. Okay. Yes, okay. that's a that, that's a cover sheet, and uh, I'm in the uh, um, Brenna and um, the friends of I'm representing the friends of City Hall. Um, we're uh, co applicants for this project. And um, you can go to the next slide. Okay, that's a that's a sample of of um, a basement room in the city hall. It's not very nice. It's it's uh, moldy. It was wet at at one time. It's it was dry the last time it was down there. It's dark. Uh, there and lots of lots of cobwebs and um, a, interesting things and and debris that it's down there. So um, you can go to the next slide. I did try get a sample of what was in some of the journals and some of the ledgers that were in, and this this is an alphabetical index of the school census. 1883 to 1888 looks like something like that. I'm not quite sure. It was difficult to. It had very little light, and and working off my cell phone light. Okay, next next slide. One of the ledgers, okay, had um, this says at the top of the page outdoor poor. So they have names. There are, there are names to the to the left on the page and the amount of money that was given to these individuals on the right of the page. So um, I can't really give you a whole lot of information because uh, it's difficult it's difficult to um, to show you on the screen. Uh, one next next slide. Here's another um, uh, a list of people it's alphabetical 1896 um, and uh, names that most of these people are maybe long gone um, or they could be our, our parents grand uh, great grandparents and grandparents um, so it, it's written out by hand it's it's very um, the names are uh, it's, legible there and not all the not all the pages are legible but uh okay the next page next slide here i found this kind of interesting uh insane outside don't know exactly what that means but i know there were names on onto the left of the page and amount of money that were given uh to these people during the months that they apparently came and and sought uh, money or or services of course this was the time before um any kind of social uh, support and welfare systems were in place so so times were rough and um 
I think that's the one, I think I have one more slide. Okay, this is the document recovery uh, company that will come in. Uh, he, um, he came in and, and asked, how much do you want to, what do you want to do with this, with the, with the materials? Do you, do, you, do you want us to bind them or just make them, or just make them available to the general public? And I uh, said, if we can put them in an archive, um, in, this, in the uh, Wisteria Hearst archive or in the uh, Holyoke uh, History Room archive for people to uh, look through and to, um, to research, that would be the best thing. The, the difficulty, the problem is um, in the current conditions that they're in, neither of those uh, locations would accept those art ledgers or uh, documents um, because they're full of mold and they would uh, infect their own collections. So, so what the government, what the, um, what the uh, Belfour will do, will come to and pack out the, the uh, properties, pack and inventory all the materials, utilize the appropriate packing procedures. They, do you dehumidify the uh, journals? There's dry cleaning services uh, to help dry clean and utilize and, and vacuum brush and wipe as appropriate the materials and the and brush away the contaminants. Deodorize to reduce and remove odor or ozone treatments. Rebox the materials, remove and discard the old damaged boxes and place the contents in new boxes. And uh, um, and then they return the materials to uh, to the city to to a proper location. Now um, that amount came up to the um, Belfort's amount came up to um, to in last year ten thousand dollars. That was not the original uh, amount. Of course, we had in twenty nineteen before the pandemic. So um, we asked them to break it down into two stages and um, they were willing to do that. Then uh, we decided we really needed to, to move forward on this project as, as soon as possible. So we went to the friends of City Hall and said, uh, can you uh, contribute a thousand dollars to keep the amount um, under uh, the 990, $9,900 and um, the friends would contribute the, to make up the difference. And so the friends agreed and uh, the contributing, will contribute $1,000 to the, to the cost of the uh, estimate. So that's my, uh, the timeline is, uh, as soon as uh, Belfour uh, can come in, in their trucks and uh, come in with their hazmat suits and, um, and gloves and box up with whatever. Um, there you go. That's our. La that's my last uh, slide. Thank you to the citizens of Holyoke and the Community Preservation Act. Um, so um, that's um, my presentation, and um, I'd like to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you, Olivia. I don't know if I have a question as much as I have a request. Okay. So I would love to have a letter sent to the committee from either, um, I don't know why I'm blanking on her name, the historian. Can I just at interrupt history you room. for a second, Meg? Uh, it looks like recording was paused. Oh. Amy, can you unrecord, unpause it? Um, I'm trying to. I don't know why that happened. Uh, oh, okay. It's, it's. It's going now. Oh, it might have been me. We're good. Okay. So my 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 question or my request was, can we have a letter sent to us either by the director of Wisteria Hearst or by um, the woman in charge of the history room at the Holyoke Library saying that they are going to accept these documents and how they will use them? Uh, you would mean you would mean uh, Penny Martorell? 
Yeah, I just like, I, I just want a I better sense of where me. are they going to go and who's accepting responsibility for them and then what will they do with them? Okay, um, that's, uh, I'll ask uh, Penny and Eileen Cosby at the History Room um, to, see, to see how they can use that. There's a lot of uh, genealogical uh, resources there that um, with names, names, some of those names are very familiar, some aren't. So um, I'll get that letter to you. How, okay. and, and you wanted to know how they would be, if they would accept them? Yeah, like I want it in writing that someone in the city, either whether it's Wisteria Hearst or the History Room, is accepting that these docs are going to be given to them. They have a place to store them and they have a use for them. Okay. And I see Israel Rivera's hand up and um, then we'll go to Alana. Uh, my question was kind of similar to like the storage and the upkeep of after. Well, first there's like, are we doing the documents or are we doing the room of where the documents are being stored? But then when you said 10,000, it's probably the documents, right? Um, um, so if the, the room that where they're being stored is, is not, uh, what do you say, a good place for them to go back into, where would they be sent? And Megan kind of touched on what, what I'm, what I, I, she, she went to the next level by asking for a letter. For me, it was going to be like, <laughs> like if the, the, if, the, uh, the library is going to take them, where are they going to store them? And are they going to store them in a place where they'll be safe, right? Because we're going to invest money in restoring them. And the other piece too is, is, is all of, are all of these do do documents salv salvageable or like, um, will we have to like, will there be some repairing from scratch? So like, I I'm with it. I'm totally with it because I, even though I wasn't raised, like, I mean, my, my roots are not from Holyoke. But if they were, I would want a place where I can go and look for, see my last name there and see if I can find somebody that I was linked to back then. So that's that's an awesome project. I just I I just want to be feel safer in us investing the money and then the the that the that the documents are stored in a safe spot and utilized in a way where that they're gonna, they're going to bang for their buck pretty much. But, right. Right. Uh they wouldn't be going back to the same room because it's, a, it's not a, an appropriate place for them. Uh, there's a lot of cleanup. Uh, uh, one of these days, uh, uh, there's a lot of- somebody came to apply for that room. I'll take <laughs> it down. <laughs> uh, it, it's not on the city hall, it's a city, uh, city hall tour these days because <laughs> It has been cleared of asbestos, so so that issue's gone. But but um, they need to be in uh, the documents need to be moved to uh, a secure place uh, that's uh, that climate controlled. They could even be technically they could even be stored uh, upstairs. And Brenna's uh, Brenna uh, has a uh, a vault that uh, where uh, and she has uh, genealogical documents there. So technically, they could stay stay in the. Um, I'll, I'll get. I'll ask Brenna for a letter too, to see how those documents could be used. So so you'll have a couple different options. Yeah, I think access to the public is going to be an important aspect on the rubric around the clear public benefit. So I the, my push for the letter is just in like you know as you're reaching out to all the possible places it could be you know, you determining which place will then lead to greater public benefit through access. Okay. Yes. Uh, Alana, you would your head up. Yeah, um, I, um, as, as you know, we had almost no hesitation in supporting this from the Historic Commission um, uh, side of things because of the sort of urgency with which any picture that looks like that is just sort of horrifying to me coming from a family of librarians and historians. So it's just, it's cringeworthy to the nth degree. But um, my concern is um, the breadth of this project. Um, uh, Israel just mentioned, you know, are these going to be uh, tangible objects? And I think we all have to take into account the likelihood that at least a you know, small to significant portion of these documents may be lost for good because of the amount of mold. Uh, Belfort may make a determination that some of these are so far gone that they're, that would cost extra money to even 
begin the process of looking at them. So there may be some books or documents that may just be lost causes from the beginning. So the question that I just like to ask Olivia is, um, you know, with regard to um, the the the, po the point on um, number one, where it says document recovery project will not require ongoing maintenance as long as they remain in a secure climate controlled environment with proper supervision. So we are talking currently about these papers that are, you said, 100 to 150 years old. What my question is, is where are the papers, you know, like, are there papers that are, you know, appropriately stored within the city? And is there sort of an example of proper <laughs> storage of these kinds of materials? Um, or are we talking like multiple, like, I mean, you're talking 150 years, that's as old as the city is. So, I mean, to say that there may be periods where their documentation was, was um, held to a better standard, or this is just one small portion of paperwork from that era, which clearly would benefit the city. I think, uh, you know, there are holes in the story of his, uh, of, of Holyoke and, and who did what. And you know, I find it fascinating that some of the papers that you found were about handing out money to people who were homeless back in the 1800s. Um, so, you know, those kinds of things I think would absolutely benefit the city. Um, the concern that I have though is the breadth. Um, I just could anticipate that the folks who are gonna be doing this work are going to see three times more work. Um, and so just thinking about the plans moving forward, if this money is to cover removal, um, the sort of assessment and the beginnings of the work, um, what happens to those materials if you run out of funding midway through this process? I guess is a good enough question as any. Um, if this ends up being a lot more money than the $10,000 you're requesting, um, and it's mid project. Um, what happens to those documents? So the documents that are down in the basement are probably the worst of the worst. Yeah. Uh, so so um, when uh, the gentleman, the safety coordinator, came from Belfort, um, he came in and sat down and looked and looked through some of them, took pictures, took it back to his uh, lab, and. Um, and took testings of the of the contaminants and the mold. So, uh, um, so I would say I'm not sure we didn't go through all of them. The, that that stack of stuff up there on uh, in the on the top uh, shelf of those shelves. I don't know. We didn't. That's going to be there. There may be there may be too far gone. So. Um, and, and unfortunately, a lot of a lot of historical documents have been thrown out from City Hall. They, they, there's not an appreciation of things that should be kept and should be stored well. And and in a 150 year old building, there there are some there's some other um, uh, there's another vault on the on this uh, on the ground level that is is full of ledgers and um, uh, big, the you, you know the big book we had to sign for the for 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 the commissions, the one that she brings up on the counter, and and opens up and and there's lots of those books in there. So it it's going to take. I I don't those are are you know aside from being digitized. Somebody asked a question: Could those things be digitized? At some point, I don't, I don't think we have the capacity to do that. I mean, uh, if somebody could want to go in and say that they want to. Um, I'm, I'm going to get off track, but um, there's, there's, these documents are the worst, probably the worst of the worst because they've been wet and they've been moldy. So uh, it would, it would take a. Uh, um, a plan. I I don't think we're we're ready to go and and to, we're so digitized today. All the documents uh, in in the city hall are digitized. And another thing, um, the directories that that are in the uh, Holyoke City um, Holyoke History Room, um, they they stopped being they stopped uh, um, 
doing city reports, I think sometime in the 70s. So there's there's information that's that's not even really documented anymore. It, it's um, um, it's difficult to say. I I, I don't know what I. I think if we can get this this small project done, and and it'll show to some of the people and to some of the residents that we do have some. There are resources that you can find out about uh, uh, who got you know they got you know a dollar fifty for the week for their food. I mean it's the, the amounts are incredible and it and it shows what a difficult time uh, the people of of Holyoke had to deal with and. It's a little picture into the window of, of how bad some of those times were. I don't think I answered your question though. <laughs> well, no, I mean, I, I think at the very least, Olivia, you acknowledge that this is an enormous project. And I think yeah. in the context of CPA and what we're doing today, you know, I think what I'm still a little um, confused about is the actual amount of materials um, because it's sort it's just been this sort of vague, there's this particularly bad group and it's hard to say, is it 20 books, 20 ledgers? Is it six boxes? Is it an entire room? Without those specifics, it feels like $10,000 really isn't all that much money, to be honest. So that, that's what I was sort of getting at. I, I could give you, I, I didn't have the right lighting because I was down there with my my cell phone flashlight and, and no, t no kidding. I didn't want to turn around all the time because I, because because there were cobwebs all over, had had there had there been good lighting and good maintenance of some of the uh, of of the situation, um, it, it they wouldn't they it, they could have been cared for in a better way, but so I think that brings to the attention that there's that so, some things should be taken care of, should be better taken care of. Um, Helene and then Michael. I, I think you're muted. Sorry. Thank you. Um, so I I put my hand up in the beginning before the discussion of the storage. And so I feel like that has kind of been um, discussed. And I think having a letter and clarity about where things would be stored is would be great. Um, I guess also, I just wanted to clarify um, that Megan was talking about the idea of um, like use and just that to me, having them available for people in a, for, as a part of a, an archive room, whether it's the library or Wisteria Hearst, just, just having them accessible for people to come and take a look. Some of them maybe you need to have gloves, whatever a professional think is appropriate. I think that to me is sufficient for them to be accessible and for use. Mm -hmm. um, and then I also, I mean, $10,000, you know, again, is it's like a terrible problem that we're like, that doesn't seem enough. <laughs> um, but I do think that, you know, if that's the estimate you have, you have to go with what professionals are telling you and so, and give us that information. Um, and that if some things are not salvageable, you know, maybe at least the data and information in them can be written down even if the, they're too moldy to like actually protect the paper and so but you won't know that unless you do this and the longer it isn't done the worse condition the the documents are in so I you know I, I take I, once we make our decisions but I think it's very understandable in a project like this that you can't guarantee everything's going to be salvageable. Like that's the purpose of restoration is it's hard and challenging. So, um, so to me, that's very understandable and very baked into like making a decision about this, but it's awesome that you and your group have identified these documents and just told us even a little bit today is really piqued my interest. Like I absolutely would go and take a look. Um, and so, you know, I just, I feel like that just that tiny bit is really interesting and, and, I have no doubt that there's more like really fascinating stuff. So I just appreciate taking this on um, as a volunteer and, 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 you know, really trying to preserve the history that's so important. So thank you for presenting. Well, uh, I'll make sure that the letters, you get the letters. 
Thank you. Um, okay, Michael, final word. Olivia, uh, to understand the process, the Belford company is going to arrive at City Hall. They're going to load the documents onto their truck. They're going to truck it back to their factory, and they're going to go through it and restore it as best they possibly can, given the conditions and the type of work needed for $10,000. Right. Um, I'm presuming that's the matter and the dollar amount we're talking about? Yes. Yes. Okay. When they return it, can you ask them? Uh, hopefully things go well and everything is done right. And it's and now a, whether you have to use gloves or not, whatever the uh, case may be, if the person uh, who's doing the restoration or the restoration person, if he could write a, a letter to you and address it to whoever it be, the library or um, of City Hall or wherever you want to put these, what is the ideal location for these? And uh, what are the conditions that a person must must a person use gloves? Uh, what is the minimum and maximum temperature and humidity rating that these must be stored in? Uh, those list of guidelines. So when these are brought back and in as good condition as one could hope for, uh, they'll be preserved in the appropriate manner that the person who did the work recommends. So we don't have to repeat this process. I don't know if we're going to be around 100 years from now, but whoever is won't have to go through this process again. So it's just a suggestion uh, if you could include a letter of instruction of how to store them, how to handle them, and so on and so forth. It would be very helpful because perhaps not all, of, not everybody in the city knows how to do it. And last but not least, was my name on the list for the insane outside? <laughs> not on that page. Oh, I didn't see you page. on that page. Okay, well, keep looking. It might I'm have been another back. page. We wait long there. <laughs> All right. There's probably a falsetti somewhere there. <laughs> That's not great for your age, Michael. It only is. It's not really great for your age. <laughs> All right. Any um anyone from the public? Any questions or comments or anyone else? Okay. Um, Wait. So can I can I just say that I I think this is a great project as a member of the public. Of course you can. Okay. I, that's it. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. I, I'll get those letters to you and uh, look forward to uh, getting started. Is uh, uh, did, Looking forward for your opinions and your decisions. Thank you. All right. You'll um, hear from, uh, or we're going to do one more round of, of historic uh, um, presentations next week for open space and rec and then um, in our next meeting, we'll start scoring projects. Um, this time around, we're hoping to actually score all projects and have everything ready to go in one lump sum to the city council, which may actually delay us a, a bit on the front end. Um, so we may not have sort of a, a final sense of what we're recommending to city council um, for a, a little bit. Um, you can know from our meetings how we vote. Um, but then, of course, we have to do the the work to create the orders for city council and get them the supporting documentation they need. And then we have to wait for them to move it to finance and back to city council. And that whole process takes some time, too. And we'll get back to you as soon as we know more. All right. Um, thank you, everyone, um, for attending today. And thank you for doing your due diligence of reading the applications ahead of time and coming up with great questions. Um, the next meeting is the same time next week for Open Space and Rec. Um, Amy, will you have the applications linked into the um, spreadsheet? Um, they're already there. There's a second tab just to the right of the first one, which is the open and rec space. It may be that I'm just missing it. When I went into yeah, that I earlier, I see the eligibility forms, but I don't, the application column seems to be blank. Okay, that might've been an earlier document you're looking at um, because- um, It's just called FY23 applications. Um, well, let me just show you, I can just share screen screen quickly and show you something here. Let's try. So do you see this? This is currently on the website. So there's the historic, and then here's the open rec space. 
Mm-hmm. Um, okay. And let's see. Uh, that just updated. Like, scroll like- over. You can see applications here. So maybe you're looking at a different document. But yeah, this is- I'm looking at one called FY23 application. So it must have been a new document that made at some point. Can you resend that? Um, so everybody has the link for the... the yeah, meeting. I can send everybody this document right after the meeting. And is this on the internal web page too? Actually, this is even directly on the website for anyone to see. Okay. Okay, so now I, I know I've mentioned before that I don't see the same things as you do uh, when I go to my uh, computer and put it on the uh, whole, uh, Holyoke CPAC you know, none of those links come out. Maybe it's my computer, but I, I see nothing in regards to open space on mine when I, when I go there. So please do send the link. Well, I actually already sent everybody um, the link in my last email, my reminder for today. I and said, I, oh, 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 that I, was yeah. a scoring sheet. Okay. You're talking about. Could you please just send yeah. the link to this? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I was just, just going to do that, that anyway. And, yeah. and it didn't it didn't show what you just showed us. Yeah, I was just going to send you all that right after the meeting. Um, Amy, just to clarify. So if I'm here on this document and I'm the public and I want to see the document that you just showed, where would I go? Oh, if you could go to announcements um, on the website. Oh. So um, click here. Yeah, click on announcements. No, who would do that? And then where would I go? Look at the top. View potential FY23 CPA projects and applications. Click on that. So because it's black, that to me reads as yeah. a header and not yeah. as a Yeah, label. I know, but I don't I, I don't really know how to change I I don't I didn't can, you know, I, I have to, to ask the web Anna. designer how to fix that. So Yeah, no, I'm just I'm just naming that. I never thought to click yeah. that because I thought that wasn't a clickable link. Okay, so that does bring us all here. Okay. All right, that's helpful. Thank you. Yeah, uh, real quick, uh, another comment on the the website piece. Amy, did you work with someone that helps you on that? Uh, We have um, Joanne Pinatel, who's uh, designed the website, and Meg's also done a lot of work on it as well. Like the website is, the design and everything is nice. Like it looks user friendly and everything. I think. For me, like a couple months ago, somebody was asking about applications and stuff and not having to not have to reach out to you, Amy. I was like, let me get it for you. So I went on the website and I actually couldn't find the application. <laughs> so I was like, uh, give me a second. And I tried to reach out. I was going to reach out, but I just I they figured it out and they ended up getting the application anyways. But it, I, for me, it was kind of embarrassing that I couldn't find it <laughs> myself. Yeah. Yeah, I still think there's some some things that we're working on in terms of really making it usable and making yeah, it's it nice. friendly. It, yeah, it's nice. It looks kind of user friendly. Friendly. I think the learnability piece about it, where it's like it's easy for anyone that's used to going on any platform, it's easy for them to learn the website fast. Um, mm-hmm. But it's it again, it's a work in progress. Our city website is still <laughs> struggling, so. It, like, I totally get that. It's not a critique of how anything is being run. It's just in the future, like, those are some things that... It's good to get feedback on it, though, because we're trying to make it really usable. Yeah. So uh, I think these are all things that we really do need to iron out because it should be boilerplate simple. It should be go on, you're like, yep, that's where I go, right? So anytime we're having a hard time finding something, please tell us so that we can try to figure out why it's not easy to find it and then fix it. All right, Michael, did you have a question before we go? Uh, no, Madam Chairman, uh, I didn't know if you want to approve the minutes of the t- December uh, 14th meeting or if you want to wait till next our next meeting. Um, let's wait till the next meeting. In fact, I think that we have put the um, the agenda up already for the next public meeting as well. And I don't think we put it on there either because typically we've just held off and done the minutes at the next official like non-public meeting. And sort of, you know, got into more business and that sort of thing. Okay. Up to you. Okay. Well, folks can score these if they want to ahead of time, of course. Um, But um, we won't actually have to turn in our scores for projects until a few days before the meeting in February. In what manner do we do that, Madam Chairman? 
um, the, the Google form because the, it's the only way that we can all vote ahead of time and then not have access to what we have all each seen, right? So you don't break open meeting law. So it has to it has to be that we all score individually and we're submitting it, but no one sees it until we get to the meeting and then we're looking at it together. Yeah, is this, I mean, what is that form that you're referring to? I, I don't, I'm not following you. Sure, it's the same form, it's the same Google form as last year. Okay, so I'll have to look for that. Uh, form send everyone so is is that going to be another link mm -hmm. i'm also happy to send a quick link to anyone who has questions and like we can just hop on a, a zoom meeting so i can show you where stuff is and go through it i'm always happy to do that too yeah if we can get that form on how to score and when to score it is is pretty sure. much important okay i'll put it in writing and i'll email it out so everyone has it well, thanks for keeping this as efficient as, as is possible. Um, you know, it's not easy, but you know, I, at no point was I really, really wondering what when when things were going to end. But I think we're ready. <laughs> All right, thanks everybody, um, thanks. and I'll see you next week. Make your motion to adjourn. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye.